Hello and welcome. My name is Jess B and this is my tech department. Today I'm looking at an absolute design classic, the one, the only, Apple iMac G3. Now the G3 was released with much fanfare in 1998 and it became an instant design classic. It was a must-have computer. It's bright colours, it's all-in-one design. It was new enough to computer perfection as you can get. Ruby here, which you can see in the background, is not really as perfect as she could be and I'll explain a little bit about that once we get into it ready. So in the meantime, come with me, let's have some fun, low skate. Meet Ruby, an iMac G3. First appearing in 1998, the iMac was a game changer and it was the computer that saved Apple from bankruptcy. Gone with the traditional beige box design, instead the iMac was all curves and colours. It was the first PC to feature USB as standard and in just over two and a half years, Apple had sold five million of these little egg shaped machines. The design was incredibly different. The new USB ports did away with Apple's old ADB connector or Apple desktop bus. There was also no space for the 3.5 inch floppy drive, replaced instead with a CD-ROM. On the front were dual headphone jacks which were perfectly positioned for listening to music with a friend, or a great set of speakers if you wanted to share your sounds with a larger audience. The 15 inch CRT was sharp and offered a maximum display resolution of 1024 by 768 Finally, there are the colours. At its debut, you could only get an iMac in Bondi Blue. Within months, however, their number of colours had increased to 5 and over its lifespan, a total of 13 different colours will be available. Ruby is, as her name suggests, a ruby coloured iMac from 2000. In summer 2000, the range got a revamp and Ruby is a summer DB Plus model featuring a 450MHz G3 processor, slot loading DVD drive and has an additional two Firewire 400 ports that are perfect for video work. Well, at least in 2000. She originally came with 64MB of memory, though by the time she reached us here at the tech department, she'd been upgraded to 196MB by her previous owner. The hard drive is a standard 20 gig version and she's running OS X 10.3.9 Panther and while I could upgrade it to Tiger, I think we'll leave her where she is, don't you? Generally Ruby is in pretty good condition with just a few light scratches along her case, which is not bad for a 22 year old machine. Her only issue is with the DVD drive. The drive reads DVDs and CDs fine, but when it comes to ejecting the disc, she's a little clingy. Now, chances are the rubber belt has just worn out over the years, so I'll need to remove the drive from the case and change it out for a new one. That may be easier said than done, of course. While I'm in there, I'll also change the pram battery before it leaks and ruins the board. Finally, I'm going to take a look at the keyboard, which needs a little bit of a clean. So, low skates, and off we go. Let's begin by checking first if the pram battery is actually any good. So let's power up the Mac and see if we have any problems. Once I'm logged in, sure enough, the pram battery is deader than last week's cat, which is not surprising. Now I could leave the computer on and see if it charges, but chances are this battery is not going to hold a charge, so let's change it. Let's begin by getting a pillow onto the table and then placing the Mac screen down onto it. Uh, we need to get access to the back of the case and we want to make sure that the screen doesn't get damaged. Now that we have access to the back, the first thing we need to do is remove the cover that protects the external VGA connector. We just need a little pry bar and that should just pop off if we're lucky. With the cover removed, we now have access to four screws, but we only need to deal with the outer two. Best of all, no special tool required, just a Phillips screwdriver. Which is nice. Ah. 
Hi, um, sorry to interrupt. Uh, apparently a lot of you aren't subscribed and uh, wait, wait, when you set up a new YouTube channel, it's not spoken about a lot, but when you do set up a new YouTube channel, you have to agree to push that um, subscribe button. Uh, I've got to tell you to hit that bell so you receive notifications of when I post new videos, allegedly. And uh, smash that like button. Sorry, it's it's all got a bit awkward now, isn't it? Um, look, I'll I'll leave you to your video. But I mean, if you can subscribe, that'd be great. It would it would make my day. Um, sorry, sorry, sorry. With the top screws taken out, we can move to the bottom of the case for where further two screws are found underneath the little stand that props up the iMac. Again, all you need is a Phillips screwdriver and with those two out, we're ready to remove the back case. Now, this is where you have to be a little careful because these old machines are brittle. Fortunately, Ruby's a trooper and getting the top off is easy, the bottom a little more tricky. Ideally, you should pull the handle of to Apple. There you go, and she's free. With the back cover off, we move on to the EM Shield, which looks just awesome. Apple really put some design thought into this, which is weird for a part that you can only kind of see through the case. To remove it, we take off uh, six screws and then simply lift it away with a little bit of uh, jiggling. We don't need to see the whole screw, so let's speed up the action and get to the good bit. A tiny bit of jiggling later and here we are look it's the main board and there's our pram battery which needs to be changed it's not uncommon with these old machines to either break the battery case or find that it has broken already and this one has broken already which means someone's been in here before me nevertheless makes changing the battery a little easier so let's get a little plastic pry tool get this thing out of there and uh, hopefully that makes our machine a lot safer turning to our drive caddy we have to unplug both the hard drive and the cd-rom drive and that's easier said than done i'm going to speed this up a little bit because there's a lot of jiggling to go on in getting these things out now that it's disconnected, we can take the drive caddy out as a whole. It's held in by just four screws, and again, they're Phillips screws, making this a nice, easy job to do. With the screws out, the drive just lifts towards you, and you're good. So let's take a look at the caddy. All we need to do is take out the CD-ROM, so that's actually not too difficult. Again, it's just a matter of a Phillips screwdriver and a few screws. With the screws out, you have to just pull the drive slightly back towards you as it's latched in, and then it should come away quite easily. There it goes. Next up, take the caddy arms off. And again, it's just a small Phillips screwdriver and a little bit of time. We're now almost to the point of opening the case. First, we need to remove two tiny little screws from the side. Here's one. Along with the other screws, we have to take the back I.O. ports off, which is simply remove these two screws and then pull the board away from the drive. It's all held in there snugly with the little plug and it's really well designed as you'd expect from Apple. With the case open, there's our drive and yeah, it kind of looks a little, you know, okay, but not brilliant. So drive off, and you can see it's kind of gone a bit square. Here's a new drive belt. It's 
actually too thin and smaller and I'm a bit disappointed about this but for some reason I feel I can just push on and hope for the best and maybe it will work who knows replacing the belt is fairly easy and then it's just reassemble to get the case back together and try out our new and improved DVD drive With the drive and the computer back together, there's only one thing to do, and that's test it out. What could possibly go wrong? Well, as it turns out, a lot. So with DVD in hand, I've tried to get it into the slot, and oh, it feels a little tight, a bit jammed, and I figure maybe the drive is just, you know, resetting itself after being screwed with. What actually has happened, and something I didn't notice when I uh, took it apart, is a piece of the drive has fallen out and is in the wrong position. Nonetheless, like an idiot, I managed to get the disc that obviously does not want to go into that machine, into that machine. And unsurprisingly, it doesn't work. Now despite getting lucky and having the disc pop back out, I don't take it's broken for an answer and continue to try and get that disc into the drive despite the fact it doesn't want to go in there. And again, what I don't know is that there is damage done to this drive. A part has fallen out. Of course, I've not worked on super drives before so I don't know this and I didn't realise it when I reassembled the drive. And now, the disc is permanently stuck in there. So guess what I've got to do? <sighs> So it turns out my problem was, well, me. I had not noticed that this little disc here had fallen out and I'd put it in the wrong place when I reassembled the drive, which effectively caused it to get jammed, keeping the disc, blah, 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 blah. I screwed up. <laughs> I had to review my footage to find out where this went. Fortunately, I had this image, which was really useful. And when I put it back together, um, it worked. The drive was great and I was super happy and I was gonna move on to the keyboard. And uh, yeah, it was really cool. Until. Are you kidding me? So here's what's supposed to happen. You take your disc, you pop it in. The arms move out the way, it slides in, these arms come back. When the disc comes back out, it spits and the arms send it out. Now there's nothing wrong with the belt, but I have read that one of the problems is even these little arms. 
arms here shrink, which could be a thing. But someone reported on one forum that maybe it's worth bending this just a little bit, just bending the top so that I can actually um, help. So let's try that, shall we? So it didn't need much of a bend, if I'm honest, so I'm just gonna flex it. There you go. That's the tiniest little bend. Barely noticeable. Let's see if that helps. Maybe get a little bit back. But let's put it back together and see if that helps. Okay, right. Well, I haven't tried it. Let's see. Yeah, I'm getting frustrated now, if I'm honest. It turns out that there was still a bit of friction within the system and it was all down to those tiny little arms. So it was back open with the case and a little bit of silicone spray later. And let's see if it'll help. So, okay, second time's a charm, I guess. Now, it's still not brilliant, I'll be honest. This goes in. It works, but it still occasionally gets stuck. And I think it just needs perhaps a little bit of grease. But for now, actually, I'm kind of happy with that. So, one more time, come on. Oh, yes. So yeah, I'll take that. Well, I'll be honest, it's beaten me. A few days after I'd finished that video where it had uh, just about popped out, the drive stopped working again. I took it apart, I greased it, I cleaned it, I checked everything over, and now it doesn't work at all. The truth is, these drives are getting on for near enough a quarter of a century of use, and if you talk to any other Apple enthusiasts, they will all say the same things. These drives are crap. They're terrible. They're known to fail. And there's not very much you can do about it. So I have to call it quits on this one. And that's a shame because I have another iMac G3 over there, Dory, who has a slot loading DVD device and she's showing the same kinds of symptoms. But you can't win them all. So until next time, remember, replay, rediscover, reconnect, and I'll see you again. Thanks for watching.